Thank you for listening to a Sunday morning sermon from First Christian Church. For more information about these sermons or FCC in general, visit us online at FCCFlora.com. Last week, we had Lane open us up uh, with uh, this part here in Ephesians chapter 2. We talked about being seated with God. And first and foremost, thank you for allowing him to come and to share. Uh, that's a great experience for a young man to be able to just take steps in his own journey in obedience with God. So thank you for your love and the grace that you showed Lane last week. Uh, today, as we get started, we're going to build off that. As he, he talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, that we've been raised with God, right, with Christ, and because of that, we're now able to be seated with him. We've been given a new knowledge, new name, new identity, all that, a new life with Christ. And so Paul, as he's writing today, he, he's writing in an unlikely style. Many of the other times his letters were identified to the church because you've got a major sin or there's a major error in the church. But what Paul is writing to him about today is, I want to encourage you to grow in your faith, in your walk, in your journey, and in your knowledge. And that's the powerful nature of Paul's letter to the church and the way that we begin to receive it. And I began to think about that in the way that we receive knowledge. And I began to wonder if my, even my own answers, would they be shaking their head at me and wondering my lack of pursuit of knowledge sometimes and its availability? I mean, I put myself in this category last service and they laugh because I feel like I'm getting old, right? And they're like, you're not old. I'm not saying like, I'm gonna tell one of those stories like, you know, I used to have to walk to school in the snow and the rain uphill and back, right? Not one of those stories. But my generation, for those who are around my age, you understand what I'm talking about, and I'll explain it here. We live between two drastically different generations. If, if you're in teaching you to understand what I'm talking about, because think about it this way, I still remember what it was like to have to write a paper and go to a library <laughs> to request a book from another library and have to wait the two weeks for the book to come in so I could rush through that book to write the paper, right? And now we live in a generation where it's like, I can look it up online. I am old, I know, I'm feeling it, all right? And so when you think about that, it's like, I am stuck between two separate worlds where it's like, one group's like, doesn't everybody just Google it, right? And then one generation is like, we actually have to get out of our houses and go to the library and have a library card and to request access to knowledge and to information. And yet, here we are today in a generation where on our phones we carry around 125 Bibles and yet we don't know God's word. Startling, right? It's a shock to our systems. And so like I began to think about that. I'm thinking my ancestors who, who sought out knowledge for a better life, they're looking at me like, you have access to all this information and you don't know how to do stuff. You could just YouTube it and you're like, hey, that's how you fix household problems, Right? And so I began to think about that as Paul was writing to the church and encouraged them to grow in their walk and their faith and their knowledge. And in, in, in seeking that out, they had to go find the letter. Does anybody have the letter from Paul? To, I want to read it, or could you at least tell me about it? And so for it to be taken and, and put into practice, they had to go seek out knowledge. And here we are just waiting to receive, and it's already been given to us. We have it, take it, and use it. And so as we see, as Lane opened up last week, if we've received Christ and with him, he's raised us up that God sent his son to do for us what he did for him. He wants to raise us up out of death into new life. And because of that now, we've been seated with him, but because of that now, he says, live it out. Walk it. Don't just take what you hear or what you say, but make it your walk. Make it your life and your story about this. And so Paul was writing to inspire those readers to, to, to keep going and don't stop, but keep growing in knowledge and faith in your walk and your journey. And so Paul was hoping that when people read his word, would they understand the depth? Because you have to remember, Paul has experienced a lot of things in his world at this time. I mean, his own transformation is turning from darkness to light. And then here he says, I've, I've been through all these things. I've seen churches plant. I've seen the work of God's hand right here. He's laying it out for him that I could just keep going and un unveiling more depths of God's love for you. And so as he's pouring it out for him, he says, I want you to see it, to know it, but to use it, to allow it to be your walk. And so for Paul, the symbolism of many of his letters revolve around three main themes, faith, hope, and love. Today we see that, that letter of love to the church. I just want to love on you guys. But I also want you to be the love to this world as well. 
that there's power when you take what God has given you and using it to continue to advance and to grow the kingdom. And so we see as Paul was writing in Ephesians here, as you'd like to open the chapter four, that's where we'll be today. But he used these first three chapters here to really build upon the depth of what God was doing, to really what God has done for us. But now he brings in this fourth chapter, the message we have for today is how we should use that to live and how we make that our way. So we see in Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse one, we see as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. If you're following along right there, a life worthy, that means your walk. So go ahead, you can mark that up right there. So sit, walk, stand right there. There's your, your walk, that you live a life that's worthy of that. Verse two says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ pointed it. Now, just in verse one here, we see the power and the magnitude of the statement here. As you notice that, that life worthy Right? They were going to live in a certain way that's worthy of what Christ has done for us. This is what we begin to see as Christians. We have been given everything through Christ. Through our old self, we were broken. We had nothing. He says, but through Christ, you've been given a new life, a new name, a new hope, a new future. And so because of that, it changes. And what we begin to see is that when we hear God's word, it requires Response, And that's what Paul's saying. Because of this, you understand the depths and the magnitude of what God has done for you. Because of that, all you want to do is respond in a way that you're living this out. And what he begins to challenge is he says, I want you to have an equal exchange for what's done. But let's talk about that just for a minute here. For as many of you guys know that I love Monopoly. That's my game, Right? And here's the thing that we begin to notice. I told you a few weeks ago that we've been introducing the kids to board games, right? And so Luke's played the junior Monopoly for a quite a while, but this week he decided he wanted to step into the big boy game and get into the real Monopoly, right? Okay, so it takes a lot for you to take your competitive nature and tone it down to a seven-year-old mentality, right? Okay, so here we are playing and we're going through the process, right? And we've made it around the board and all the properties are bought. I look around and I realize none of us have any monopolies? And I said to say, no, daddy doesn't play like that. We got to get this game moving now. So here I am bartering a three-way trade between Jess and Luke and myself, trying to find a way that I can give her a monopoly and him a monopoly and ultimately win this game. It was for the kids, right? Okay, so, and so here I am. And so I think I've done very well once again in competitive nature, but in fairness, because he's seven, I've offered them things of equal value that would balance out that I can say, you're, you're getting a monopoly and you're getting this. Luke, I'm giving you double what you paid for that property plus other property as well. And he looks at it, no, you can have it all for a hug. And I'm like, no, we don't play for hugs. This is a monopoly. <laughs> and so then he's like, well, you want the dark blue. I'll take the light blue. And I'm like, Jess is like, it's not equal exchange. <laughs> and that's the thing. We've been given something of such magnitude and such power and such that we can never afford, we can never earn. And yet all he asks is an equal exchange because he gave his all, we would give our all. Even though it would never line up, it would never match, the numbers don't work. But he says in effort and attitude in life, would you just give him your all? And that is the power that he says that it just desires this equal exchange that our life and our walk would match when we just give it all to him. And so that's what we begin to see, that we can't match the cost, but we can match the obedience. And that is in the life of the believers in our walk, that we can match in our obedience to him. And that's where we remind ourselves that we don't work for God's love, we work from God's love. And that's the grace in our life, that he gave it freely to us. But now, once again, it requires response on behalf of the believers. 
We must now live worthy of what we received back in Ephesians chapter two, being raised with Christ, that we would now live in equal response to that. Now, one thing that I love about Paul's letters to the church, and one thing you might be able to identify as well is when someone tells you something of such boldness as he says, you need to walk this, what does he do? He says, and let me show you how. I love that about Paul's nature because it'd be so easy for him to say, you need to do this. But then he says, let me tell you how it's possible, how you can see this take place into your own lives. And there's power in that. When he opens the eyes of believers to see things, maybe that we wouldn't have seen before in this way. And he opens up and he talks about this. He says, with humility that you're willing to, to give over to Christ, let, let him lead, but also in gentleness. In the Greek, this preus, as it talks about it, it talks about this idea that gentleness, that we'd live in gentleness in this way that, as it used by definition, not to be insulting to us as humans, but it says it's like an animal who is trained. But an animal who is trained is under control. That we realize that through that process that we would be under control. Now, one of the hardest disciplines that you can ever imagine, it's called self-control, Right? We hate self-discipline. Amen. Am I just the only one? No one else? Okay, we're all quiet here this morning. Wake up, it's New Year. It's all right. Self-discipline is horrible because I have to enforce discipline upon myself. And because I realize in this nature of life, when he talks about this, when he's opening up and he shares with us just his stories that Paul has, but he talks about our own, that we have to conduct in gentleness, to be in control. We realize in our world, in our self nature, control is almost outside of our limits, so we can't grasp it. What he's pointing to here is something so much more powerful. And maybe it's not that we're under control, but we're under God's control. I, I can't rule myself because I, I fail at self discipline, but under God's control, I can give into his authority and his power. And what's even more powerful than all of that is this. Sometimes it's understanding that I can still be happy and I can still be fulfilled even when I'm not in control. For all my control people in the room, you just cringed your toes, didn't you? But there's power in understanding I can be happy even when I'm not in control. When I'm under God's control. When I'm in tune with his spirit and his calling, we see that the role that we have here is powerful. And that's why when Paul was writing, he understood the symbolism, the power of the words that he was saying and the way in the which that we're able to follow and to live out a life that's following him. Three of the four words he uses, he gives us are fruits of the spirit. He understood the impact that it has on our lives and the way that we live. And he illustrates this in the way that we live out the church. As we fill the role of Christ as the body in this world, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. And we see in Ephesians chapter one, as, as Christ was the head, it says, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. We are the redeemed function of the body of Christ. To go until it says it's time that our walk begins to be the walk of Christ into this world. And while we don't fill the same role, nor should we, but he's talking about the unique nature of each and every one of us in connection with the body of Christ, that we share, we function. And so when we think about this, he's pointing towards the idea that we're able to all Get along, And he's not just talking about the unity inside these walls, but it says that we have a common ground outside of all things in this world. Anything that could separate or divide, it says you have a commonality with one and other, a place for Jew and Gentile, those who have been separated all these years are now able to be together, connected under one similarity, and that is the love of Christ. See, the powerful nature of what Paul is writing here is it's not just a... He's saying it's a spiritual unity. It's not a denominational unity. It's not a building unity. But he says it's a spiritual unity. That God's love breaks down all walls, all barriers, everything that we have that can separate or divide us. And it's not one church against the other, but it's the body of Christ in unity together. And that's why he says with Jew and Gentile, because we, as the entire embodiment of Christ, have a commonality and a factor of Jesus' love in our lives. 
And so often we think, well, it's my church's unity or my belief's unity, but no, it's unity in him. And when we realize we have that commonality factor inside of us to relate with other people, then there's no longer a division because what we begin to see is that God's love is for them as much as it was for us. And that's the power that church is more than just a registry and an enrollment. It's more than just gathering on one day, but it's a lifestyle that we begin to live out. Now, Spurgeon says we want unity in the truth of God through the spirit of God. This will let us seek after, let us live near to Christ, for this is the best way of promoting unity. Division in churches never begin with those full of love to the Savior. We have to want unity and love with him. John Wesley writes, he says, I want the whole Christ for my Savior, the whole Bible for my book, the whole church for my army fellowship, and the whole world for my mission field. And what he begins to say is he wants it all. We have to realize that there's a bigger picture, a bigger perspective here. And it's not just for our own fullness, but it's for the fullness of the body of Christ. And here's the thing that we begin to realize. And one of the things that I'm guilty of as well, have you ever been cooking like a big meal? Maybe it's like Thanksgiving River. In time, it's time to eat the meal. If you're the cook, you're like, I'm really not that hungry because I've been eating all day, right? I, I have that thing where I'm like, yes, it's this big holiday. I guess I'm eating. I'm like, I'm stuffed. And one thing we realize is we, we miss that time of sharing with other people. And sometimes in the word of God, we say like, we go out and we're like, well, I'm already full of the spirit. Woof, I'm stuffed. And we don't take time to break bread with other people around us. By that, I mean sharing God's love with them, sharing the stories with him because I've already ate today. See, it's one of those factors that can get in our way. And so when we begin to think about in the vision of God and we think about what he can do in fullness, sometimes we think, well, I'm already full when he says, well, you've been filled so you can pour out. And that's the challenge he gives us to live that out. And so when he talks about the unity of the body, he's not just talking about the church, but he's talking about in unity that we have the ability to love those around us as we serve. We see in Ephesians uh, chapter four, verse four through six says, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one father of all who's over all and through all and in all. We have this because what we share in common, as it just said there, when we share with others, we share in that love that we are one body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father above. That's greater than any potential difference we could have with one another. And so when Paul was writing, he says, well, as you walk, would you see the vision? Would you see something that's far ahead of you and not just what's ahead of us, but let's see what's in the distant future to understand the planning in your walk, to understand the resources, what it's gonna to take to get there, when you think about vision, it's an understanding, it's a study of what is around and what's available to us to keep taking steps. But one thing we always understand is vision always requires progress. And that's the thing. What Paul was asking was, would you continue to keep in focus where God is calling you? Would you keep taking steps? Don't stop. Don't stop in your life. Don't stop in your faith. Don't stop in your journey, but keep taking steps every day to walk and to live this out. That we be a church that is focused on the right things as we grow. Because what we understand is the spirit inside of us, the church is an unstoppable force if we let it be. Spurgeon said it this way, he says, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. We have to share God's word. Either we're living it out or faking it. Romans 15, 16 says, to be a minister of Christ is to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so the Gentiles might become an offering accepted to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We understand what it means for us. We understand what it means for others that we've been here to distribute, to give it out, focus. God's word removes fear and removes our worry, but it allows us to freely live and to serve in fullness. And his design for us would be, we'd be this unstoppable force. But the problem is some of us have never started moving. But the spirit that lives inside of us is willing to go and to take this world by storm, pointing all things towards Christ. 
But what he begins to talk about is this idea that we'd live in fullness, completion, that we wouldn't separate, that we wouldn't break things down, but we'd allow it to grow and share together. See, sometimes we, we try to break love apart from faith. And we try to say, well, I've been given love, but you've been given faith and you, no, but we've been given all this through Jesus together. And we don't get to pick and choose, but he says, I've given you this, my all. See, if you've ever been around students playing the game, when the integrity is lost, the game breaks down and it's fun for no one, right? Have you ever tried to play the game of tag and there's always that ran one random kid, I'm not pointing one kids out, but that one random kid, who says, I want to be it, tag me, tag me. And then the next thing you know, the game's over. It's no longer fun for anyone because it's lost the integrity. It's lost the rules of it. In the same way in our walk, it breaks down when we stop trying to fulfill all parts of it. I'm just here to give grace. You forgot about love. You've broken down the rules. It's not functioning. It's not working. I'm here, I'm here for love. Love me. It's about us. And so what Paul was writing to him, says, we can't lose the integrity and the value of what God has given us. That faith is not without love and love is not without faith that he bore those together so that we'd have faith to see beyond what we can see right here in this world. We see beyond what we have in our circumstances and our lives. But he says, the love that you've given is to break down the walls and the barriers that separate and divide us as human beings and he unites us as children of God. And so as he talks about unity of the body, he talks about us being willing to disciple and to share, to minister to our world. We can't expect this world to believe what they don't see in us. Romans 1, 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because in the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last that is written. The righteousness will live by faith. And we won't try to stand on our own understanding. But we live by the word and the power of God. That we'd practice in gentleness and patience and peace in his spirit that we'd see the calling that God has for his people. Because sometimes our current reality is all we can see. But there's a powerful notion in the walk with Christ. For those of you in school right now, 2,000 years from now, your school won't stand. For those of you who are working in a job, probably 2,000 years from now, your company won't exist. 2,000 years from now, you better not be here. But one thing that will still stand is the word of God and the church that is built in his faith through Jesus Christ. And so when Paul writes, he's saying that we would follow in that faith, that step. And what he's challenging us to do is to live it out because you and I, through the love of Jesus, we are an unstoppable force. But it's time we put it in the drive. It's time we begin to live it out. Because the church that becomes an unstoppable force is a change this world needs. This world is waiting for the church to step up, to stand tall and to speak out. But the church has lost its voice. It's time we go back to live a life worthy of our calling. And we've called to be unstoppable. Let's walk it out.